Good morning. Good morning, Yujun. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Let's see. So far, nobody is here, but that's okay. Let's D and they're sitting. But welcome to my abode. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Hmm? I hope you're all fine and dandy. Hey, Mia. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, guys. I know you, I know some of you have work and all that, so they can't make it in game, but that's fine. It's, as long as you guys are here listening to me, I'm happy. Uh, morning, Mia. Good morning, Yujun. Good morning, Dian. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, if I don't sound exactly exciting, it's because, um, my cat's having trouble, and, um, uh, today I have to bring him for an ultrasound and all that to find out what's wrong. Um, but, I have a job to do here, to read to you all, and I'm going to read to you all. Uh, and it will distract me for at least like a couple hours or so, you know, from the reality. Uh, let's hope that it's nothing too serious. Um, oh, Yujung said that the PF still says missed. Ah, <laughs> uh, my apologies, my apologies. So, yeah, I haven't been uh, able to uh, stream a lot lately because of recent happenings, as I say in my Twitter post. But if you are not on my Twitter, uh, my cat is sick. My cat is 14 years old. Uh, he looks healthy as fuck. Like, he's... he's He's really fat and all that, but it could be the fat that is not making him so well inside, to be honest. So, um, I feel like it's my fault for n neglecting his health, but I can't blame myself too much, you know, because he always looks so healthy and happy and all that. Um, but... I'm alright, like, it's just, uh, it's just been a crazy past week, a lot of things have happened, and, um, just trying to live, you know, <sighs> trying to survive every day, um, but Nudibo is just always something that I look forward to, it's just that last week I just couldn't find the energy to do it, and I was stupid, I said that it's, I was a like I told you guys on Wednesday that we'll have the new book on Friday but I forgot that I had like the pottery class on Friday morning so I didn't do it of course obviously and because the the pottery class was just me trimming uh, the pottery piece that I made so it wasn't like super interesting that's why I didn't stream it and then uh, a personal friend is going through something really tough therefore borderlands is also somewhat cancelled for the time being so i'm not sure I, I maybe i'll replay something on for borderlands maybe we'll play something else what do you guys think i i have plenty of games in my in my uh steam could easily play something else. I could play. Uh, okay, maybe I could finish up Yakuza. Maybe I, oh, maybe I can play Yakuza Six because I haven't played Yakuza Six yet. 
so I don't know I'll just maybe I'll just replace I just add a stream basically don't worry about my cat it's okay uh the doctors know what they are doing uh he's old he looks healthy but over the past year or so uh I preemptively try to tell myself that he's really old and he's gonna die one day and I shouldn't be too sad about it because he has an amazing life my cat has had an amazing life he I tell you like since if you guys don't mind me rambling but I'll tell you the history of my cat okay so I was when I was back in my hometown which is a small town my neighbor one day brought back this cat um he has white and little beige um uh, stripes on him that's like very vague and not very like he's he's like a very beigey white cat basically and but the thing that stood out from him the most is his absolutely beautiful turquoise eyes like i've never seen eyes like that hence uh all of my characters in game have green eyes have like turquoise ish green eyes i've n never seen eyes so beautiful in my life on a cat at that time so i didn't mind it too much but my family don't like cats so uh but you know if he comes to my house i'll just you know pet him a little bit and all that but there was one day that i needed to use the car and he was sleeping underneath my car and i couldn't i don't dare to move my car um at all uh because i, I was very scared that i would run him over if he's like right underneath my car you know he might panic and then run towards the wheel so i had to like bait him out from the underneath my car with um anchovy a dried anchovy um and he came out and then after that i just left to go to my extra curricular class but when i came back he started i started to see him f sleeping on the floor mat in front of my house more and more and then slowly he moved to sleeping on the shoe shelf which gave him an uh, uh, affinity f towards shoes like if he sees any shoes lying around in our house right now even at age 14 he would go towards the shoe and like brush his face against the shoe no matter how smelly or dirty the shoe is he would like just i think it's just his kitten instinct that it it was a like nostalgic thing for him because he used to sleep on the shoe shelf so much when he was a kitten so yeah but he's went through a lot of shit um he he has he has hernia when he was a kitten uh so i had to bring him for surgery to close up the hernia uh he had really high fever once and pretty much almost died that's basically when i kind of like force my family that i don't care what you guys say i'm gonna bring him inside the house so that i can nurse him back to yeah, uh, it's very common for cats to get hernia because they jump around so much, so they might get injured. Yeah, so so I nursed him back to hell from uh, his high fever, uh, and then after that, he has really bad fungus infection that basically strip off a lot of his fur. <laughs> so when he was a kitten, he really went through a lot of shit basically, and then after that. Um, he was okay for like four or five years until he has a very bad case of UTI infection uh, whereby um, he has to get castrated basically uh, because of the, the infection fuck him up so much that he has to get the whole thing removed it's, uh, it's very unfortunate so he's like um, he's a eunuch basically uh, great cat um, he wasn't treated very well by my other 
family members. My mom loved him. My, my mom and I loved him, but he wasn't treated like he was treated like a nuisance in the house uh, because we live in like apartment and stuff. So he always has to be leashed up because um, we were always afraid that he will jump off the windows. Uh, there were times when uh, he managed to get out from the leash. Um, <laughs> yes, that's a very great quote, by the way. So th there were there were many many times when he got out from the leash, and then he would be standing like right on the edge of the window, and we ha we will have to like panic and try to get him back in, because he like we heard so many cases of cats just jumping off, yeah, like you know from from the tenth floor from the twentieth floor. You know, so, but uh, as so as long as soon as we move to this new place, uh, we realized that he can be left alone without any leash because the balcony is made of like glass, and he's way too fat and lazy and weak to be able to like jump high enough to escape to to jump off from the balcony because of the glass window. Um. So for the past four years, um, I would say he has had, he has been having the greatest life a cat could ever have. He roam around the house like it's his. He sleeps in my room. He sleeps in the guest room. He sleeps under the bed. He sleeps by by the window. He sleeps on the balcony. He sleeps on the sofa. He sleeps on the other sofa. He sleeps on my bed. He sleeps on my mom's bed. Um, he has a great retirement life, basically. So, all beings die. I will too one day. So will you. So, I'm at that stage where... I am so afraid of what the result is going to be for today's ultrasound because it could be cancer, it could be something else. I don't know what's going on because they have to expedite the ultrasound. Like the ultrasound was supposed to be done in the next two weeks, but because they found out something that was quite wrong with his urine sample that they had to expedite the ultrasound so that definitely worries me a little bit more than I should be but I have come to terms that all beings die and so will my beloved cat um, but if one day that happens I am not going to cry over it maybe I will uh, but I'm going to accept it as a fact and that I am very happy to have him in my life for the past 14 years and that he has had a great retirement life for the past four years um, I know I'm being dramatic right now because I still don't know what's wrong but it's definitely worrisome I'm not gonna lie um, because they have to expedite the process and when the vet feels like they have to expedite the process it doesn't sound good to me so anyway uh, I have ran past my reading time and I've bummed everyone out I'm sorry but I just want you guys to understand that uh, things are going on in my life right now that I can't control and I'm trying my best to not derail or spiral um, therefore uh, if I happen to get overly emotional at certain time or anything when I'm reading um, I want you guys to understand that it is something that comes within my heart and soul and I tend to resonate a lot with books and writing and literature so Anyway, I think it's time for me to start the book. Uh, today, as the title says, we are reading 
Lonely Castle in the Mirror by Mizuki Tsujimura. Um, it's a pretty thick book with very small letters printed. Uh, so I think this might be just as long as I Am a Cat by Natsume Soseki. But maybe! But Natsume Soseki's book took about 10 videos, 10 days to finish. This one maybe I'm, I'm thinking maybe 8 days to finish it up. Uh, we shall see. Uh, if I'm not rambling so much right now about my real life situation, maybe I could have like finished it earlier. But anyway. <sighs> Let me get a sip of water and tea. And we shall start our reading session for the day. Oh. Thank you. Today we are reading Mizuki Tsujimura's Lonely Castle in the Mirror. Chapter 1 First Semester Wait and See May Beyond the curtain drawn Beyond the drawn curtains floated to the sound of the little truck from the local supermarket coming to sell produce. It's a small world. The song from the Kokoro's favorite ride at Disneyland boomed from the large speaker on the back, reminding her of the world of laughter and hope that lay just outside her window. Ever since she could remember, it always played the same song. It was abruptly cut off, and an announcement followed. Hello everyone, this is a produce truck from Mikawa Market. We have fresh goods, dairy products, bread, rice, bread and rice for sale. The supermarket along the highway was far away and you needed a car to get there. So ever since Kokoro was small, the Mikawa market truck had driven over every week and parked behind her house. Its melody was the signal for all people in the neighborhood and mothers with small children to come outside and, and buy their provisions. Kokoro had never gone to shop herself, shop there herself, though her mother apparently had. Mr. Mikawa's getting on in years, so I wonder how much longer he'll keep coming, she had said. In the past, before the supermarket appeared in the area, it really had been convenient for the truck to drive over, and plenty of families brought its produce, but it was beginning to lose its customers. Some even complained about the loudspeaker, calling it noise pollution. Kokoro didn't think it was a nuisance, but whenever she heard the melody, she became like it or not, aware that it was daytime and a weekday, forced to be aware of it. She could hear children laughing. It was only after Kokoro stopped going to school that she just that she discovered this was what the 11 o'clock in the morning was like in her neighborhood. While in the elementary school, she only ever saw the Mikawa truck during the holidays. She had never listened to it so intently. On a weekday, in her bedroom, curtains drawn, her body rigid, not until last year. She watched 
TV with bated breath, the sound on mute, hoping the light from the set wouldn't filter out through the curtains. Even when the Mikawa truck wasn't there, there was always young mothers and children playing in the park beyond their house. Whenever she spied a stroller lined up by the park benches, colorful bags hanging from the handles, a thought came to her. It's not early morning anymore. The family who gathered between 10 and 11 always disappeared by midday, heading home to have lunch. And then, she slid open her curtains a li tiny little bit. Spending so much time alone in her bedroom and gloomy during the day despite the, cur or the orange curtains, feeling of guilt welled up in her. She felt she was being blamed for being slack and lazy. At first, she enjoyed being at home. But as time passed, though no one said anything, she knew she couldn't carry on like this. There were good reasons why set rules existed. Rules, you should open your curtains in the morning and all children should attend school. Two days ago, she and her mother had visited a private alternative school, they used the English word, and today she had been sure she could make a start there. Yet, when she woke up, she realized it wasn't going to happen. As usual, her stomach was killing her. She wasn't faking it. It really did hurt. She had no idea why, but in the mornings, her stomach and sometimes even her head pulsed in pain. Don't force yourself to go, her mother had said. So when she went downstairs to the dining room, she wasn't worried about her mother's reaction. Mom, my stomach hurts. And her mother had been preparing some hot milk and toast. And when she heard this, her face went blank. She wouldn't meet her daughter's eye. As if she hadn't heard, she looked down and carried a mug of hot milk over to the dining table. How does it hurt? she asked. Then, her mother yanked off the red apron she was wearing over her work clothes, a trouser suit, and draped it over a chair. The same as always, Kokoro said in a small voice, but before she managed to finish speaking, her mother interrupted. The same of always? But you were fine until yesterday. The school we visited isn't like your public junior high, you know? You don't need to go every day. There are fewer children in each class, and the teacher seems so kind. You said you would go, but now you're telling me you won't? Her mother obviously wanted her to attend, but a sudden accusation made that clear. But Kokoro wasn't feigning illness. Her stomach was really killing her. When Kokoro didn't reply, her mother shot an irritated glance at the clock. Ah, I'm going to be late, she said, clucking her tongue. So, what do you want to do? Kokoro's legs felt paralyzed. I can't go, she said. It wasn't simply she didn't want to go. She couldn't. When Kokoro was finally able, with great effort to mutter a response, her mother let out a huge sigh <sighs> and grimace, as if she too felt a twinge of pain. Is it only today you can't go, or are you never going to go? Kokoro couldn't say. She wasn't going today, but she had no idea if the next day she might not have a stomach ache again. Okay then, her mother said, and rose to her feet. She picked up the plate that with Kokoro's breakfast and threw it in the triangular waste collector in the corner of the sink. So no milk either? And after I heated it up for you? She added, and poured it down the drain without waiting for a reply. A burst 
of heating of hissing steam rose up from the hot milk, quickly vanishing under the sound of tap water. Kokoro had planned to eat it later, but before she could get a word out, the toast and milk were history. Could you please move? Her mother said, brushing past Kokoro, sitting motionless in her PJs. She disappeared into the living room. After a few moments, Kokoro heard her talking on the phone. Good morning, this is Mrs. Anzai. Her earlier testiness had gone, replaced by a formal, polite tone. Yes, that's correct, she heard her mother say. She says her stomach hurts. I'm so sorry. When we visited the school, she seemed so enthusiastic to start. Yes, that's right. I apologize for any trouble. The school that her mother had taken her to was called the Kokoro no Kyoshitsu, literally classroom for the heart. A sort of children's counseling center and alternative school. Above the entrance were the words supporting children's development. It was situated in an old building, a former school, or perhaps a hospital when they first arrived. Kokoro had heard the children's voices coming from upstairs. Elementary age kids, she thought, from the sound of them. You must be a little nervous, Kokoro, but let's go in, her mother had said, smiling. She looked more on edge than her daughter, but nevertheless gave Kokoro's back a tiny encouraging push. Kokoro had felt awkward that she and the school shared the same name. Kokoro means heart. Her mom must have noticed a coincidence too. It wasn't as if she named her that just so she could bring her there. Even thinking such a thing brought a pang of pain. This was how Kokoro first learned that the so-called non-attendee children had somewhere else to go other than normal school. Back in elementary school, no one in her class ever refused to go to school. A few ch children might fake a sick day or two. There hadn't been a single child who had to go to a school like this. Even the teachers who greeted them all referred the alternative school by the English word school. Kokoro felt a bit strange in the open slipper she had been given and as she sat waiting, she nervously curled up her toes. So, Kokoro, I understand you are a student at Yukishina No. 5 Junior High School. The teacher was smiling gently as she checked all her information was correct. She was young and reminded Kokoro of all those cheerful, ever-smiling older girls who danced and sang on children's television. The woman had a sunflower-shaped name on her blouse, with a tiny portrait of her, undoubtedly curated by one of the children at the school, and the name Kitajima written on it. Yes, Kokoro said. Despite her efforts, her voice came out sounding weak and muffled. She wondered why, but at that moment, it was the only voice that she could manage. Miss Kitajima smiled broadly. I went there too, she said. Oh, their conversation stopped. Miss Kitajima was actually a beautiful young woman her short hair giving her a vivi vivacious look, and she had the kindest eyes. Kokoro immediately liked her, and she envied her no end that she had long since graduated and no longer had to attend the junior high. It was hard to say that Kokoro herself was actually attending junior high. She had just started the school in April, for the first month, then stopped. I called them to let them know. As she reappeared in the dining room, her mother's irritated tone had resumed. She looked at Kokoro, who hadn't moved an inch the entire time, and frowned. Look, if your stomach still hurts, you should go back to bed. I'll leave the lunch I made for you to eat at school. 
So if you feel like eating, go ahead. Hamada spoke without so much a glance at Kokoro and started to get ready to go out. If only her father were here, Kokoro thought painfully, he would have stand up for her. Both her parents worked, and since her father's job was further away, he left early in the morning. Most days, when she woke up, he was already gone. If she just stood there, she would most likely to, to get told off further, so Kokoro started to climb the stairs. From behind, like a final stab, she heard her mother let out another loud sigh. <sighs> Before she knew it, it was 3 o'clock. She had left her TV on, and it was now airing an afternoon talk show. After a segment highlighting celebrity scandals and news, it switched to an infomercial and Kokoro finally hauled herself out of bed. Why was she so sleepy? When she, went at, when she was at home, she always felt so much sleepy than she did at school. She rubbed the sleepy dust from her eyes and wiped away the trace of drool from the corner of her mouth, turned off the television and went downstairs. As she stood in the kitchen sink and washed her face, she realized how hungry she was. She went to the dining room and opened the bento lunch her mother had made for her. As she untied the ribbon she, holding the check cloth around it, Kokoro thought, of how her mother must have pictured her as she wrapped the bento as how she saw her enjoying the lunch at school. Her chest tightened at the thought and she wished she could about apologize to her for not going. There was a small Tupperware container too on top of the bento. When, when she opened it, Kokoro found slices of kiwi fruit, one of her favorites. The bento itself was something she loved. Three colored soboro rice, minced cooked cod, ground chicken, and egg in a lively design. She took one bite and hung her head. When they first visited the school, it had seemed like a fun place. So, why couldn't she bring herself to go? This morning, she had thought that her stomach ache had prevented her from going to only only today but now she had wasted the entire day she had lost all desire to go at all the kids at the school were of both elementary and junior high age they all seemed like normal children none struck her as the sort who couldn't get on in public school none of them were especially overweight or particularly depressed and none of them seemed like losers no one wanted to hang out with the only difference was that the junior high kids weren't in uniforms two girls a little older than older than kokoro had brought their desks together facing each other and snatch of conversation she had overheard that totally sucks for sure but you know seemed no different from the chat at her junior high. When she overheard this little scene, her gut started to ache again, though she also found it strange that girls like this, seemingly so normal, had dropped out of school. As Miss Kitajima showed them around, one child came up to her complaining that Masaya hit me! The child had charm and Kokoro imagined herself playing games with him if she started at the school. She could see it clearly. Her mother said she would stay in the office downstairs with the head of the school while Kokoro went on a little tour. Her mother mentioned it but Kokoro got the distinct impression that she had been to the school a number of times herself before Kokoro made her visit. The way that the other teachers greeted her mother made it clear they had met before. Kokoro remembered how awkward and uncomfortable her mother had been when she first broached the topic of visiting the school and realized how her mother, in her own way, was trying her best to be sensitive to Kokoro's feelings. When Kokoro stood outside the office, 
Where her mother was waiting, she heard what she took to be the voice of the head of the school saying, Elementary school is such a pleasant, comforting place for most children, so it is not at all unusual for many to have trouble fitting in when they made the transition to junior high, especially with a junior high like Yukishina number 5, which has grown so large. What with other school merging after the school restructuring, they now have one of the largest number of students. Kokoro took a deep breath. At least they're not touching on painful subjects, she thought. And it was true. When she entered the junior high, she suddenly gone from a school with two classes in each year to one with seven, and it had definitely thrown her. She barely knew anyone in her homeroom, but that wasn't it. The what? That wasn't the reason why she had trouble fitting in. This woman had no idea what I've been through, she thought. Miss Kitajima, standing beside Kokoro, seemed completely unfazed by what they overheard, and knocked firmly at the door. Excuse me, she announced, the older, the, the older head teacher and Kokoro's mother seated opposite each other turned simultaneously to face them. Her mother was clutching a handkerchief, and Kokoro hoped she hadn't been crying. If she left the television on, she would end up watching. And if she did, she would feel she had accomplished something even though she had wasted the entire day. Even if she was watching a program with a plot, a drama for instance, she realized that most of the time she couldn't recall the story. What am I doing? she had wondered, and suddenly found the day drawing to a close. On the screen, they were interviewing a housewife on the street, and when she casually made the comment that she was out while the kids are at school, Kokoro felt like this was a barb rebuke re to directly straight towards her. Kokoro's homeroom teacher at Yukishina number no. 5, Mr. Ida, was a young man who stop, stopped by their house to check on her from time to time. Sometimes Kokoro would come downstairs to see him, sometimes not. Mr. Ida is here, Kokoro's mom would announce. Do you want to see him? Kokoro knew she should, talk, she should really talk to him, but on days when she told her mother she didn't want to, her mother never got upset. All right, I'll talk to him today, she would say, and show him into the living room. Today is really not a good day for her, her mother would apologize, and Mr. Ida would say, that is fine, no problem at all. Kokoro hadn't expected them to let her get away with it, and it left her confused. She had always believed that she had to do what her teachers, her parents, and other adults told her, but how they readily assented to her now made her finally understand this was a real emergency. Everyone's walking on eggshells because of me, she thought. Occasionally, her classmates from the elementary school, Satsuki Chang and Sumida Sang, could would also come by to see how she was doing. They had moved into different classes now, and maybe the teacher had asked them to visit, but Kokoro felt embarrassed about skipping school, and she would refuse to see these long-time friends when they stopped by. She really didn't want to see them. She felt there was so much she wanted to say, but making them feel obliged to come over made her uncomfortable, and that's how it turned out. While she was eating the bento, the phone rang. Just as she was wondering whether to get it, it clicked on the answering machine. Hello? Kokoro? If you are there, will you pick up? Her mother's voice, kind and calm, she hurriedly picked up the phone. Hello? Kokoro? It's me. Her voice was gentle now, not like this morning. She heard her mother laugh. Where was she? It sounded quiet around her, so maybe she had stepped out of the office. You made me worried when you didn't answer. Are you alright? Are you eating the bento? How's your stomach? I'm okay. Really? 
I was thinking that if you're still feeling ill, maybe we should go and see the doctor. I'm okay. I'll come home early today. It's gonna be alright, Kokoro. We're just learning how to deal with this, so let's do our best to work through it, okay? Her mother sounded so cheerful, but all Kokoro could manage was a muttered, Sure, in response. Her mother had been so cross this morning, so what had happened since? Maybe she got advice on the situation from one of her colleagues at work, or perhaps she was having her second thoughts about her earlier outburst and thought she would call. Do our best. She had no idea if she could live up to her mom's expectation, but she went ahead and agreed with her anyway. It was 4 o'clock now and she couldn't stay downstairs. The curtains in the bedroom upstairs were, as in the morning, still closed. As she waited to hear the now familiar sound, she began to tense up. She could never get used to it. She tried watching the television with the sound turned down to take her mind off it, but nevertheless, she sat on her bed anxiously waiting. Any minute now, there it was. She heard the mailbox in front of the house swing shut with a clang as someone dropped the letter inside. Ah, Tojo-san's here, she said to herself. Moe Tojo-san, a girl from her class. Tojo-san was a transfer student who, who had joined their class at the end of April, after the semester had already begun. She had arrived late due to some formalities to do with her father's job, apparently. She was a pretty girl, good at sports too, and her desk in class was right next to Kokoro's. Moe's athletic build and long lashes took Kokoro's breath away. She reminded her of one of those beautiful French dolls people used to collect. Tojo-san didn't have any foreign blood, apparently, though she did have the attractive features often found among Eurasians. The, the teacher assigned her to sit next to Kokoro for a reason. They were neighbors. With Tojo-san's house only two doors down from Kokoro's, his aim was that as neighbors, they should get to know each other. And Kokoro hoped they would. And in fact, in the first two weeks after she began school, Tojo-san asked Kokoro if she could address her by the informal Kokoro-chan. They also walked to school and back home together. Tojo-san had even invited Kokoro to come over to her house. Her home had the basic floor plan as Kokoro's, though she got the impression it had been designed with Tojo-san's family specifically in mind. These building materials were the same as was the height of the ceilings, yet the ornaments on display in the hall, the pictures hanging on the wall, the light fixtures, and color of the carpeting were all different. The identical construction and layout made these differences stand out all the more. Tojo-san's home was so smart and stylish, with paintings just inside the entrance based on the fairy tales her father was apparently fascinated by. Tojo-san was, was a college professor researching children's literature. On the wall, he had framed line drawings from the old illustrated books he had picked up while in Europe. Scenes from the stories Kokoro was familiar with, Little Red Riding Hood, Sleeping Beauty, The Little Mermaid, The Wolf and the s yeah, Seven Young Goats, Hansel and Gretel. Pretty weird scenes, aren't they? Tojo-san said. By this time, Kokoro was addressing her, too, more familiarly as Moe-chan. Papa collects drawing from these artists, including their illustrations from the, for the Green Brothers Green books and illustration from the Hans Christian Andersen stories. The scenes didn't strike Kokoro as weird exactly. The one from The Wolf and the Seven Young Goats was the well known episode where the wolf breaks into the young goat's house and they scramble to escape. 
The drawing from the Hansel and Gretel too was one of the more famous one where Hansel is walking in the forest tossing out breadcrumbs. There was a witch in the picture but that alone told you which story it was from. Their house were the same size inside but for some reason Tojo-san's house seemed much more spacious. In the living room there were shelves lined with books in English, German and other languages. Tojo-san took one out. This one is in Danish, she said. Wow, said Kokoro. She could understand a bit of English, but Danish was totally alien. Anderson was a Danish writer. Tojo-san explained bashfully. I can't read it either, but you can borrow it if you are interested. Kokoro was thrilled. She might not be able to read Danish, but from the illustration on the cover, she knew it had to be the ugly duckling. And there are lots of books in German too. Tojo-san said the brothers Grimm being German and all. This made Kokoro even more excited. She knew many of the Grimm's fairy tales, and this boring pictures book seemed so stylish and cool. You should come over to my house next time, Kokoro said. We don't have anything nice like this though, Kokoro really thought it would happen. At least she thought it should. So why did things turn out the way they did? Tojo-san ended up turning her back on Kokoro. Kokoro quickly worked out that Sanada and her little cohort had something to Tojo-san about her. One day in class, Kokoro went over to her. Moe-chan? She said, and Tojo-san looked up, obviously annoyed. What do you want? Her expression said. It was clear Tojo-san found Kokoro a nuisance. She no longer wanted to be in Kokoro's company, especially not in front of Sanada and her gang. Tojo-san and Kokoro had been discussing which after-school club to join, but when the time came to meet, as they had promised to each other, Tojo-san strode right out of the room with Sanada and her crew. When they were out in the hallway, Sanada said loudly enough for Kokoro to hear, I feel so sorry for those loners. As she slowly packed away her school books, ready to go home, she noticed the stares from the other kids and Kokoro fi finally understood. The comment had been meant for her. Loner. Loner. The word whirl around her head as she left the school building. She intentionally avoided the other school kids' eyes. If that gang was going to be there, it was enough reason for her to lose all desire to check out any clubs. Why did they pick on me like that? She wondered. Why did they give her the silent treatment? They whispered about her behind her back. They told other girls not to have anything to do with her. They laughed, laughed, and laughed, laughing at her Kokoro. Her stomach ached and she locked herself in one of the toilet club cubicles. She could hear Sanada giggling just outside. Break was almost nearly over, but she couldn't leave while they were outside. She was on the verge of tears but steeled herself away and emerged only to hear a little exclamation from the adjacent cubicle and Sanada was coming out. She looked directly at Kokoro and grinned. When she later heard from her classmate what she had done, Kokoro blushed with shame. Wondering why Kokoro was taking so long, Sanada had crouched down in the adjacent cubicle and was watching her from below. When she pictured the scene, Sanada must have witnessed her squatting there under pants around her ankles. Kokoro thought she felt something collapsed inside her. The classmate who had informed her while lamenting how horrible it all was, also made Kokoro promise never to reveal that she had been the one who told. Kokoro stood there, frozen, dazed, totally crushed. This happened again and again until the incident took place and Kokoro made the fateful decision. She stopped going to the school. 
Even after Kokoro had dropped out, tojo san would stop by to deliver leaflet and notices from the school. She did it very matter-of-factly. Kokoro had hoped they would still be friends, but tojo san merely placed a bump in her mailbox and never once rang the doorbell. Kokoro had witnessed this any number of times from her upstairs window. tojo san dumping the leaflets as if fulfilling a duty then hurrying off. Now, she watched idly as the figure in school uniform and a shirt with a blue-green collar and a dark red scarf appeared, the same uniform she herself had worn in April. Kokoro felt relieved at least that Tojo-san came by alone on her errand, probably because the other girls lived elsewhere. Her teacher had probably told Tojo-san to stop by and see Kokoro, and Kokoro decided not to think about the possibility that, that Tojo-san was intentionally ignoring these instructions. The mailbox clanged shut and moe Chang left. There was a full-length mirror in Kokoro's room. She had got her parents to put it up as soon as she had chosen her room, an oval-shaped mirror with a pink stone frame. When she looked at herself in it now, she looked sickly and she felt like crying. She couldn't stand to look at it anymore. She quietly lifted the corner of the curtain to make sure that the tojo just to make sure that tojo san had left, then collapsed in slow motion back on her bed. With the sound down, the glow from the TV struck her as overpoweringly bright. She thought about how now she had stopped going to school. Her father had taken away her video game console. If she doesn't go to school and still has video games, she'll never do any studying. He had said to the mother. It looked like this next step was to take away her TV as well, but her mother had cut him short. Just wait and see, was her verdict. At that moment, Kokoro hated him. But now she wasn't so sure. She had the feeling that he might be right. That if, he, if, that if she did have video games to hand, that would be all she did all day. She certainly wasn't doing any studying at this point. Keeping up with schoolwork in the new school, junior high wasn't going to be easy. She felt lost and not knowing what to do. The glow in her room was becoming really bright. She casually raised her head from her pillow, thinking that thinking she should switch off the TV and gasped. The TV was not on. She must have turned it off without realizing. The light was coming through the full-length mirror near the door. What the... She got off her feet. She got off her bed and walked over to it without really thinking. Light seemed to be radiating from the inside of the mirror. It had become so blinding she could hardly look. She reached out her hand to touch it. She realized a bit later that it might be hot, but the surface was still cool to the touch. With a flat palm, she pushed a little harder. Oh my god! She screamed to herself. Her palm was being sucked right into the mirror. The surface was soft as if she was pushing against water. She was being dragged to the other side of the mirror. In an instant, her body had been swallowed up into the light and was moving through the tunnel of chilled air. She tried calling her mother but no voice emerged. But when she was dragged somewhere far away, up or straight ahead, she couldn't tell. One moment, please, for a tea break. <clears throat> hey, you! Wake up! The first sensation was of cold floor beneath her cheek. She has a... She had a splitting headache, and her mouth and throat were parched. 
Kokoro heard the voice again, but couldn't lift her head. Come on, wake up! A girl's voice, a girl from the lower grades of elementary school by the sound of it. Kokoro didn't know anyone that age. She shook her head and blinked and sat up. She turned to look at the direction of the voice and gasped. A weird-looking child was standing there, hand on hip. Are you awake now, Kokoro and Zai-chan? She was looking at the face of a wolf. The girl was wearing the sort of wolf mask usually found at the temple festival. She was wearing an outfit that clashed with the wolf mask, a pink lace string dress, the kind of a girl would wear to her own piano recital or to a wedding. She was like a live version of a Rika Chang doll. And she, she knows my name. Kokoro's eyes darted around. Where am I? The shining emerald on the floor reminded her of something from the Wizard of Oz. She felt perhaps she was in an anime or in a stage play. Then she noticed a dark shape looming over her. She looked up and took a huge, deep breath. Her hand flew to her mouth. She seemed to be in some sort of a castle. A castle from a western fairy tale with a magnificent gate. Congratulations! A voice sang. Behind the mask, Kokoro couldn't read the little girl's expression or see her lips move. Kokoro Anzai. Kokoro Anzai sang, You have the honor of being a guest in this castle? She spread her arms out wide and spun around. The magnificent iron gate began to creak open. Kokoro's mind went blank with fear. She had to get out. The wolf girl continued to gaze at her inscrutably. Kokoro hoped that if this was some sort of dream, then the next time she looked, the girl would have vanished. Something caught the edge of her vision. Kokoro slowly turned around and the mirror on the wall was shining. Not the same oval mirror as the one in her bedroom, though it seemed of similar size. Its frame was rigged with multicolored teardrop stones. Kokoro scampered towards it. The, this mirror must surely connect up with her room. And if only she could pass through it, she might be able to go back. Kokoro suddenly felt the weight of the little wolf girl clinging to her back, tackling her from behind with her spiny limbs. Then, the force of her charge sent Kokoro tumbling face first on the emerald colored floor. Don't you dare run away! The little girl shrieked in her face, in her ears. I've been interviewing six others all day and you are the last. It's already four o'clock and I'm nearly out of time. I really don't care. Kokoro found her voice. She was sure she sounded extremely harsh on this girl, so much younger than her, but Kokoro was feeling panicked. Lying on the floor, she tried to prise the clinging girl off her back. She twisted her head sideways for another look at the surrounding. It was like a Disney Cinderella castle ripped from some fantasy. This has to got to be a dream, she thought, but the girl now pining her on the pinning her on the floor with her legs around her waist with a tangible weight and substance. She continued crawling towards the shining mirror where she felt the little wolf girl begin to pound her with her fist. What's wrong with you? Don't you want to know where you are? You could be on the brink of an adventure. You are telling me you really don't care? Use your imagination for once in your life. I will not! Kokoro shouted back nearly in tears. In her head, she was thinking she could still get back, pretend it never happened, but she was becoming more certain this was no dream. The girl 
tighten her grip around Kokoro's waist and squeezing her side so hard Kokoro could hardly breathe. As I was saying, we will grant you a single wish. It will come true, even for a dullard like you. So listen to me. As I was saying, the girl had said, but this was the first time Kokoro had heard anything about a wish. She was too out of breath to respond. She tried as hard as she could to shake her off, shoving the wolf girl's snout away from her shoulder, where it was rubbing on her neck. Visible above the mask, the girl's hair was so soft, the head of Kokoro's had pushed again so tiny. It surprised Kokoro how much it really did feel like a very small child. Nevertheless, she gritted her teeth and shook her sideways to the floor. She crawled further, then struggled to her feet and reached out to touch the shining mirror. Within seconds, her hands was being sucked into the surface as if passing through water. Wait! A voice shouted and she held her breath. Shutting her eyes, she pushed against the mirror with her whole body and leaped into the light. Hey, you better come back tomorrow! She was assailed by a deafening, blurry noise. Then, it faded away. She blinked her eyes several times and found herself on the floor back in her room. The TV, her bed, the stuffed animals lined up along the window. The bookshelf, desk, chair, dressing table with hairbrush, cl clips, comb, everything was in place. She looked behind her. A full-length mirror was still on the wall. It was no longer glowing. It was merely reflected her day's expression. Her eyes was racing. Uh, sorry, her heart was racing. What on earth had happened? She instinctively reached out to the mirror, then quickly pulled her arm back. Perhaps someone was watching her from be from the other side. Perhaps that little wolf girl's skinny hand could would reach out and pinch her. She shuddered, but her but the mirror remained still and mirror-like. She glanced at the clock on the wall ob above the TV and drew in a quick breath. <sighs> Her favorite soap had already started. More time had passed than she had realized. Perhaps it was just the clock that was fast. But sure enough, when she turned on the TV, the soap had been airing for some time. The clock was definitely not wrong. What is going on? She sudden she suddenly bit her lip. Then she stepped backward into the from the mirror for more perspective she, and gazed steadily into it. Is it real? In her in her PJs she could still feel someone squeezing her sides, keeping her feet at a distance but with arms outstretched and bending from the waist. She turned the mirror around to face the wall. Her fingers were trembling. What is going on? She said aloud. She remembered shouting at the top of her voice. She didn't talk to people much, so her voice was usually little, a little hoarse. But she remembered how clear it was, like a bell. Is this what's called a daydream? Or am I losing it? After she had calmed down enough to think, she realized what was distinct possibility. Oh no, oh no, oh no. What if staying at home all day is making me hallucinate? Then what? Your wish will come true, the little girl had said. As I was saying, we will grant you a, wi a single wish. It will come true even for a dullard like you. Those words came to back to her, loud and clear, too distinct to be hallucination. Hi, I'm back! Her mother's voice at the front door. She had been annoyed if she found a daughter watching TV, so Kokoro grabbed the remote and switched it off. Hi, mom! She called. Her mother had told her on the phone that she had been back 
early and sure enough she was Kokoro was about to go downstairs when she shot another glance at the mirror but it was no longer shining her mother was in a good mood I know you like gyoza so would you like to help me make some from scratch her mother placed her shopping bags on the floor they were full of cans of milk coffee yogurt fish sausage she had been complaining that with Kokoro at home so much she had, she had to restock the fridge more often mom hmm her mother decked out in a business wear, slid off her shoes, and clipped the silver barrette in her hair and headed into the kitchen. Kokoro wanted to share what she had just experienced earlier, but as she contemplated her mother's back, she knew she couldn't. It would probably ruin her mother's good mood, and anyway, she wouldn't believe her. Kokoro herself still couldn't believe it. Never mind. Kokoro skidded on the floor towards the kitchen to help out, to help put away the shopping. Don't worry, her mother said, and she gave her a gentle pat in the back. I'm not upset you're not going to the school today. Kokoro realized with a start that her mother thought Kokoro was feeling guilty. It was your first day, first time today, after all. And I do think it's a lovely place, so wherever you feel up to it, just let me know. When I called this morning, the teacher you met said to come in whenever you are ready. She's really very nice, I think. The events earlier had stirred Kokoro so much, she had completely forgotten about abandoning school. It was now clearer than ever that her mom really hoped Kokoro would decide to go and Kokoro began to feel extremely guilty. They said the next session is on Friday, her mother said. Okay, Kokoro managed to say. Her mother had probably called her father because he came home earlier than usual too, in time for dinner. He didn't mention the school. Well, gyoza, he said, as he sank down on his usual chair at the dining table. Darling, her mother said, do you remember when Kokoro was little, how she could eat whenever we had gyoza with the, ra with the wrappers? I do. She would take out all the fillings and I end up eating the rest. So I started making the skins from scratch. I thought if she doesn't eat the filling, at least I could make some delicate, delicious wrappers for her. Kokoro picked at her bowl of rice. Do you remember, Kokoro? Her father asked. Of course not. All she knew was the story they had made out of it, which they repeated every time they had gyoza. I don't remember, Kokoro said. She told her mother, so many times she couldn't eat such a huge portion, but she still insisted on loading her rice bowl to the brim. Did her parents always want her to be a kid who only ate the skin of gyoza? They want me to be how I was before, be before I became the girl who won't go to school. Kokoro wondered what she should do to the mirror if it began to glow again. But there was no light to seem to, seem to come out of it for now that it was turned up, turned towards the wall. She felt a surge of relief, but yet, with the mirror lurking in the corner of her eyes, its presence weighed on her. Even after she had gone to bed and closed her eyes, she turned over a few times to snatch a look. I must be hoping for something, she thought vaguely as she drifted off. You could be on the brink of an adventure and you are telling me you really don't care? A little wolf girl had said. Truthfully, Kokoro was hoping for something. At least a little. Hoping that this world, this, sorry, this would be the beginning of something special. The Chronicles of Narnia, which sat in the bookcase downstairs, crept into her mind. How could a portal into a different world would not be appealing? 
<laughs> Maybe she shouldn't turn. Shouldn't have run away. She must have wasted an opportunity. Of course, she wouldn't have preferred if there was a rabbit and a girl. It, if a rabbit had shown around, like Alice in Wonderland, not some shrill girl in wolf mask. She was beginning to feel expectant. So what did she want to happen anyway? Now that the mirror wasn't glowing anymore, she suddenly began to regret what she had done. What if, what if the mirror started to shine again? Then she might decide to enter it one last time. With these thoughts in mind, she melted into sleep. Next morning, the mirror was still shining. Feeling a bit bolder, she gently turned it around to face her, lost all that she could. She turned around to face her, but all she could see was her own reflection in her PJs with her messy bed head hair. As usual, Kokoro had breakfast with her mom before she left for work, and then washed up before switching, before heading back upstairs. She would often spend the entire day in her PJs, but today she decided to change and even make an attempt to say to tidy her hair. At nine o'clock. The mirror began to shine. It glittered like a pool of water reflecting the sunlight. She breathed in slowly. She reached out and slipped into. She slipped her hand inside. She pushed further, and her whole body had been sucked in. Her vision turned a dazzling yellow, and then white. And as she passed into the other world, one quick break. I need another cup of coffee. I'll be right back.
bit. Good morning. Sorry, I'm gonna get coffee. Because I don't know if you guys realize I, the way I was reading it, I was basically falling asleep. I didn't have much of a good sleep last night for obvious reasons. So, yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, thank you for being here, you guys. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Instead of the emerald green floor and the mighty gate of the previous visit, what she saw as a vision gradually cleared were two staircases and a large grandfather clock above them. She blinked slowly. It looked like the set of a Hollywood film with a grand foyer inside, inside a mansion with thick carpeted stairs like the one Cinderella ran down in the film. The staircases led up to a landing with the tall grandfather's clock hallway, halfway along. Inside it, a large pendulum swung gently back and forth, revealing a sun and moon design. Kokoro knew it. This was exactly the same castle she had been to the previous day. A group of people were gathered at the bottom between the staircases. She blinked at them in astonishment. They stand back in silence. There were seven of them, including Kokoro. They appeared to be of a similar age. So you came. The little wolf girl came bounding towards her, wearing before a mask and a smart dress. She stood with her legs hip wide apart in front of Kokoro, her expression unreadable. You ran away yesterday and now you are back, eh? Well, the thing is, with the others there, a mix of boys and girls, she felt less intimidated. She noticed how one of the boys, head bent, was holding what looked like a game console. Beside him stood a girl with glasses and a plump-looking boy. Another boy leaning against the wall under the clock seems at first glance quite good-looking. Even in his sweats, he looked a bit like a celebrity. As Kokoro inspected them, she began to feel as if she had seen something she shouldn't have and dropped her eyes quickly. Hello, a voice said and she looked up. A tall girl with the ponytail was smiling at her. We have also just arrived. We heard you ran away yesterday so this child told us to wait here for you so you wouldn't run away again. This ch child? Call me the Wolf Queen, announced the child stiffly. Okay, okay, the girl said. The Wolf Queen told us to wait for you. She said there would be seven of us. You're the only one who ran off. The little girl, the Wolf Queen said, I thought it would be too chaotic if you all arrived at the same time, so I got you in one by one. But what is this place? The girl gave a haughty little laugh. Well, I was trying to explain things to you when you ran off like a dumb fool. We are in the same boat as you, the ponytail girl said. Kokoro had thought they were about the same age, but this girl sounded older, calmer, and more grown up. She told us we are all in a castle and that can grant us a wish. This from someone else, a sharp, high-pitched voice, a sort of actorly voiceover tone that Kokoro might normally have found off-putting. Kokoro turned to see the girl in glasses sitting on the, on, uh, on the bottom step of one of the staircases. Her hair was in bowl cut and she wore a beige parka and jeans. Correct! The wolf queen trilled loudly. Kokoro thought she could hear a distant howl ringing in her ears. It made her freeze. 
eyes widening in alarm, they stared at the wolf queen. Unconcerned, she carried on. Deep inside this castle is a room none of you is permitted to enter. It is a wishing room. Only one person will eventually have access. Only one of you will have your wish come true. One little red riding hood. Little red riding hood? You are all lost, little red riding hoods. The wolf queen said. From now on until next March, you will need to search for the key that will unlock the wishing room. The person who finds it first will have the right to enter and their wish will be granted. In the meantime, every one of you must hunt for it. Do you follow me? Kokoro did not know what to say. The others exchanged silent glances. Don't expect someone else to answer! The wolf queen squealed suddenly. If you have something to say, then speak up. I do. It was the bold ponytail girl who first welcomed Kokoro. I would like a bit more on this, the girl said. How can a wish come true? Also, I just don't get it. Why have you even called us here? Who are we? I mean, is this real? And... Who are you? <laughs> the wolf queen covered her ears at this sudden barrage of questions. Not the wolf ears, but her own human ears. You people have no imagination at all. Can't you simply be satisfied that you have been chosen as heroes in the story? It has nothing to do with being satisfied. This not from the ponytail girl but from one of the boys. Since Kokoro had arrived, a boy had been perched on the left hand staircase, absorbed in his game console. He had a booming voice and a defensive look in his eyes behind thick glasses. I also don't get it, he said. Yesterday the mirror of my bedroom suddenly started to shine and now we have ended up here. You need to tell us what's going on. Ah, a boy has finally found his voice. The wolf queen cackled. It takes boys longer to open up, so now I'm expecting great things from you. The boy frowned and glared at her. The wolf queen was unfazed. We make selections periodically. She said, trying to sound managerial. She gave a false cough. <clears throat> you are not the only ones to have entered the castle. At various times, we have invited other lost little red riding hoods, and quite a lot of them in the past have had their wish come true. You should consider yourself lucky to be selected. Can I go home? A boy at the top of the stairs, who had remained silent until now, had stood up. A lean, quiet boy, his pale face and freckled nose reminded Kokoro of Ron in Harry Potter. No, you cannot! The wolf queen shrieked, and the air disturbed by another howl. The boy suddenly leaned backwards as if struck by a blast of air. Let me finish. The wolf queen said, glaring at him. Hear me out before you decide to do anything. First, your entry and exit will be through the mirrors in your bedrooms or in the castle. From now on, you come straight here to this foyer to prevent anyone from attempting to flee. The wolf queen looked meaningfully at Kokoro, and she felt everyone's eyes on her. A wave of shame flooded through her. The castle will be open from now on until the 30th of March. If you don't find the key by then, the entire castle will vanish and you will never have access ever again. So what if we do find it? This was another new voice and the wolf queen turned towards it. The boy gave a small yelp and crouched behind the banister of the stairs, 
Only his chubby fingers were visible. So, if someone finds the key and their wish granted and the mirrors won't connect up here anymore, he carried on bravely from his hiding place. Once the wishing room has been unlocked, it's game over. The castle will immediately close down. The wolf queen nodded sagely at her own words. I should add that the castle is open every day from 9am to 5pm Japan time. So you absolutely must get back through the mirrors by 5. If you stay in the castle any later, you will face a truly horrible penalty. A penalty? A simple punishment. You will be eaten by a wolf. What? The group gaped at the wolf queen. Y you're joking, aren't you? Kokoro wanted to ask but couldn't. Eaten? Y you mean by you? A chilly silence fell over them. With a moment to think, a new possibility occurred to Kokoro yesterday. The wolf queen had said to her, It's already 4 o'clock and I'm nearly out of time. And when she got back home, her favorite TV soap had already started and the hands on her clock had moved forward. Meaning that while they are in the castle, time passed in the real world as well. The castle was open from 9 to 5 until 30th of March. It sounded a lot like a school timetable. Kokoro scanned the faces of her peers, the handsome boy in sweats, the girl in the ponytail who seemed to have her act together, the girl in glasses with a high-pitched anime, anime voice, the brash boy absorbed in the game console, the quiet boy with the freckle who reminded her of Ron, the meek, chubby boy hiding behind the banister, seven of them all together. Kokoro thought about the question posed by the ponytail girl. Why? Have you even called us here? Kokoro didn't know, but she was sure. S everyone here had one thing in common. Not a single one of them was going to school. About that penalty you mentioned, it was a ponytail girl. Being eaten by a wolf. She seemed calmer than the rest. When you say eaten, do you mean this literally? The wolf queen gave an, an exaggerated nod. That I do. You'll be swallowed up whole, but don't be tempted to do anything you have read in a story, such as calling your mom to come and rip open the wolf's stomach and stuff it with rocks. Just... Make sure you are very, very careful. Her words only confuses them further. Are you going to eat us? I'll leave that to your imagination, but a huge wolf will indeed appear. A powerful force will punish you, and once it's triggered, there's nothing anyone can do to stop it, not even me. The wolf queen looked at each one of them in turn. And if one of you is punished, each of you will be held equally responsible. If one of you is barred from going home, then none of you can leave. So, watch your step. Are you saying all the others will be eaten too? I suppose I am. The wolf queen said vaguely with that small wave of hand. Anyway, stick to the opening hours. Don't sneak in here when the castle is closed to search for the wishing key. As the wolf queen continued to lecture them, it seemed more and more as if the wolf lips on the mask were actually moving. We have barely met, but we are supposed to be responsible for each other? The girl with the glasses and the bowl cut said in a high-pitched voice, We don't actually know each other, but we have to trust everyone? 
correct? So do your best to get up and leave it up to you. Silence. Will you be here when the castle is open? Kokoro screwed up her courage to ask a question for the first time. The wolf queen spun around, stared at her, and Kokoro flinched. I'll be here and not here. I won't be here all the time. Call me and I'll come out. Consider me your caretaker and supervisor. Kind of an arrogant supervisor, thought Kokoro. Someone asked another question. The 30th of March is a mistake, isn't it? There are 31 days in March. This was, the, this was from the boy in sweats, the only one who hadn't spoken yet. The boy that Kokoro has secretly thought so good looking, like a character in a manga for girls. The wolf queen shook her head several times. No, you heard correctly. The castle remained open until the 30th of March. Why? The boy asked. Is there a reason? Not really. If anything, the 31st of March is when the castle closed for maintenance. You see, that sometimes, no? Closed for maintenance? The castle was the Wolf Queen's home, yet she seemed so detached from it. The handsome boy seems unconvinced. And was about to add something, but then he looked away and muttered, Okay. Is that actually real? A wish coming true? This time, it was the boy fiddling with the game console. He turned his body moodily towards the wolf queen. Kokoro looked curiously at the game console since she didn't recognize it, though curiously at the game she couldn't tell for sure where she was. Sorry. Oh shit! Kokoro looked curiously at the game console, since she, she didn't recognize it. Though she couldn't tell for sure from where she was standing, the boy's tone had a scathing ring to it. You're saying if we find the key, any wish can come true. You can use the kind of weird supernatural power that got us here to make it come true. Well, we can <laughs> become a wizard or enter a video game or something? Is it what you're saying? I am. Though I wouldn't advise it. I don't know anyone happy who wish for any of those. Enter the world of a game and the enemy might kill you in an instant. But if that is what you want, feel free. You are so downbeat aren't you if i go into pokemon it won't be me doing the fighting it'll be the monster still clutching his game console the boy said this so matter of factly it was hard to tell how serious he was he nodded to himself and then certain things you need to be aware of while you are in the castle the wolf queen continued surveying her group a little more closely only seven of you are allowed to entry if you are trying if you try to bring someone with you they won't get in so don't attempt to get any outside help to find the key what about telling people about the castle this again from the good looking boy the wolf queen turned to face him she answered all their questions so smoothly but this one seemed to stump her if you think you can talk about it with others, go ahead and try. She paused. If you think anyone will ever believe you, the problem is people will think that you are weird. You are the only ones who can get in, so it will be very hard to prove it exists. But we can go through the mirror in front of someone, can't we? If someone actually saw their kids disappear into a shining mirror, they'll be worried enough to believe it's true. This from the boy with the game console. The wolf queen sighed. <sighs> you said kid. So you're talking about getting your parents to help you? Not your friends, but adults? Yeah. In that case, you'll get back home. The adults will probably smash the mirror or else they will forbid you to go through again. And if they do, then it's over for all of you. None of you will be able to come back here again. And the search for the key will be terminated. 
For my sake, I'm not in favor of you using the portal in front of anyone else. As a security precaution? You are saying that someone, when someone else is around, we shouldn't enter the mirror. Well put. The Wolf Queen nodded empathetically at the handsome boy's question. Her large wolf ears flapped. As long as you stick to the rules, then you can do whatever you want while you're here. Talk, study, read books, play video games, and I'll permit you to bring in lunch and snacks. You you mean there's nothing to eat here? Kokoro was surprised to hear the chubby boy hiding behind the banister speak. She did look overly fond of food, and but she was amazed that he was brave enough to ask about it. No, there isn't. The wolf queen said, the truth is, you're all food for the wolves, so eat up and put a little meat on your bones. The wolf queen gazed silently for a moment and then jerked up her chin. Introduce yourselves, she ordered. Over the next year, you'll be seeing a lot of each other, so go ahead and get to know each other better. Easy to say. Kokoro had thought. They all exchanged looks. She was anxious that the wolf queen might scream at them again, not to look at each other for answers. She ducked her head, fearful that the wolf queen would let out another howl. Wolf queen, do you think you might leave us alone for a moment? The ponytail girl said. We'll get on well, don't worry, but we would like to work things out on our own. Well, all right. The wolf queen didn't seem particularly irritated. She tilted her mask sideways. Take your time. I'll be back in a while. She raised her arms as if she was going to float away, flapped them gently up and down, and then in the blink of an eye, she vanished. The seven were left speechless. Did you see that? Yep, she disappeared. What the? Whoa! Exclamations flew hard and fast between them. As luck would have it, her absence meant Kokoro could speak up. I'll start. I'm Aki, the pony girl, ponytail girl said. They sat in a circle in the foyer between the double staircase and the grandfather clock looming over them. The girl's tone was a little awkward and Kokoro looked at her more closely. She gave her first name, no last name. I'm in ninth grade. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you, Kokoro said, keeping it polite because she was slightly in awe of the older girl. Kokoro had never experienced this before, a group of kids introducing themselves so formally. Usually, when introductions were made, there was a homeroom teacher or other adult presence. This April, just after she had started junior high, the students were introducing themselves and one of the boys near the beginning of the register announced his name before sitting down in a hurry. Their teacher, Mr. Ida, had teased him. Come on, he said. You can give us more than that, can't you? Tell us your name, the elementary school you have come from, and a few words about what you like to do in your spare time. After that, the other kids mentioned baseball, basketball, and other things they enjoy. When Kokoro's turn came, she said karaoke. She thought she would like, if she said she had liked reading, the other girls will label her as introvert. So, when several girls ahead of her said, said that they like karaoke, she copied them. Now, with their so-called caretaker, the Wolf Queen Napson, no one urged anyone to add any extra detail. The only one who looked like she might do so was Aki, the girl who had already introduced herself, but since she merely said her first name and grade and nothing else, everyone followed suit. It was enough. I'm Kokoro, Kokoro said boldly. She might not be able to remember everyone's name immediately, she thought. Even introducing herself in to such an intimate group was enough to get her stomach churning. I'm in 7th grade. Nice to meet you all. I'm Rion, the handsome boy, said next. 
people tell me it sounds like a foreign name but I'm Japanese it's a uh, written with the re in Rika signs and the on that means sound I'm into football and I'm in seventh grade nice to meet you seventh grade like Kokoro Kokoro heard a smattering of nice to meet you's and she could tell the situation felt awkward would they all have to explain the characters, the name written in their hobbies and things? But Aki didn't seem to want to add anything to her introduction, and Kokoro wasn't about to take the lead either. Casually mentioning at this point that she was into karaoke would no doubt backfire. Hi, I'm Fuka. I'm in 8th grade. This is from the girl in glasses. Once she got used to her high-pitched voice, it wasn't so bad. Each word sounded bright and creeps. A couple of seconds of silence followed as she seemed to consider things, then she broke into a straightforward, Nice to meet you all! I'm Masamune. I'm in 8th grade. This was the boy with the game console. He stumbled on, not meeting anyone's eyes. I'm tired of everybody always saying when saying Masamune sounds like samurai warlord's name or the name of a famous sword or brand of sake or something it's actually my real name he was the only one who didn't add a nice to meet you the others lost their chance to respond and the tall boy seated beside him took a breath and ready to speak he was the one who looked like ron in harry potter who had earlier stood up and asked if he could go my name is Subaru, okay? Nice to meet you. I'm in 9th grade. Kind of an oddball was Kokoro's take on him. Otherworldly, you might say. She had never heard any boy she knew end a sentence like that. With a challenge, okay? But Subaru seemed like the type who could say that and get away with it. He wasn't like any boy she had met before. Ureshi no! A small voice said. This from the chubby boy who had been worried whether there was anything to eat. Eh? She repeated her himself. Ureshino, it's my surname. It's a bit unusual. Nice to meet you. His bashfulness struck a chord with Kokoro. She immediately found herself wanting to ask him which characters his name was written with, but she stopped herself. Really? So that's how it's written? A casual voice asked, and Kokoro gulped. It was Rion. Ureshino took a deep breath. He didn't seem to mind the question at all. The Ureshi part is written with the character Ureshi, which means happy. And the No in the character in Nohara, feel. Whoa, that's a lot of strokes in writing those characters. I don't even know how to write the first one. What year in school are you supposed to learn to write Ureshi? That must be a pain during tests when you have to write your name at the top. Yeah, it takes so long to write it out that sometimes I've got less time to actually do the test. Ureshino Green, the very image of happiness, the mood lightened. I'm in 7th grade, he added. Nice to meet you. So we are all in middle school, Aki said, looking, looking around and nodding. She seemed to be in charge. I know the Wolf Queen might be listening in, but do you have any idea why we are brought here? Aki's voice start starting to sound a bit tense and quivered si slightly. Nope, Masamune said, not skipping a bit. Not a clue. That's what I thought, Aki nodded. Kokoro felt a wave of relief herself. Introductions over, they fell silent and looked awkwardly away. They had all spoken in different ways, but Kokoro was sure they had all come to the same realization. None of them was going to school. None of them dared to broach the topic, but even if they didn't put it into words, it clearly weighed on everyone's mind. The silence lingered until... Have you finished? The wolf queen standing hands on hips at the top of the stairs. How long she had been wait watching, no one knew. There were a couple of startled yelps and then as they, as they turned towards her, 
Come on, don't believe you have just seen a monster. It felt like that, though no one say it. So, are you all ready? She asked. Ready? Did she mean ready to begin their search for the key and make their wish come true? There was only one key. Only one person's wish could come true. Kokoro knew they were all thinking the same thing. As Eve, seeing through them all, the Wolf Queen said, Well, that's it for today, for today then. You can do whatever you like now. Stay in the castle, take a stroll around, go home, it's up to you. Oh, and one other thing. The words came next, so softly and gently, come Kokoro. You each have your own individual room here in the castle, so feel free to use it. You'll find your name plate outside, so check it out later. And that is the end of the chapter named May. The month of May. In Lonely Castle in the Mirror. I think it's something like this. There's a chapter They're called the, the first semester, and then after that, there's May, and then the next one is June, basically. How do y'all find it so far? I like I like the way it's written. Definitely, it's very modern esque. <sighs> Did you all enjoy it? Exactly the mood that I want for you all. Like, just a, oh, thank you so much. Just the, just the everyone is here. Like, I, I like. I personally really like to like rest on the floor. I don't, I don't like couches or anything like that. Mm. Thank you so much for the applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so big. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I. This is the mood that I wanted. Oh, thank you so much, you guys. Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Really means a lot that you guys made it here today with me. Arum! Hey! <laughs> Sorry, not. Uh, pressed the wrong thing. Arum! And Mia! Thank you so much! Oh! Yuzhou wants a uh, tarot! Alright, alright, alright! <laughs> oh, alright! Thank you so much for coming, by the way. I really appreciate it. This is really fun. Uh, okay, let me get... Oh, Yujung is so ready, okay. I'm not ready. I'll go get my, my deck. Be right back in about two seconds. do it one by one okay let's do it okay so <sighs> card of the day five time shuffle and I pick it from a spread let's go okay one two three four five spread it Today we are picking the card of the day for you, Jung. Okay. 
Are you ready? Oh, I haven't read tarot in a bit. I've been so busy. You have page of sword. Page of sword. Page of sword. Swords usually means uh, your state of mind, your mental activity, and your communication, uh, ideas, and spiritual stuff. Um, mostly, um, I would say sword. Rep mostly represents um, your yeah state of mind and communication so you have page of sword page is usually usually a little boy who is very um, curious and very uh, naive um, so oh my god if okay I think you might like this one so the key words for Page of Swords is study, vigilance, apprehension, inexperience, curiosity, and a message. So today, I'm not going to say that um, it's gonna like tarot is never for me as something that predict the future. But today, you could have maybe a message coming in for yourself but it also can mean that today is a very good day for you to um, study as in study study uh, it's a good day for you to study to learn how to communicate with people better um, if you need help ask for help if you if someone needs your help help them um, it's a good day to be curious so by curiosity, usually, usually when you are curious, you want to study more about a subject. So be curious, make use of your curiosity, and study hard. And uh, yeah, so when you're reading the page of swords, uh, it usually says that you are thinking about testing yourself, like or embracing a new challenge. So you could be probably maybe wanting to test yourself uh, on something or you know thinking about entering college or beginning a career or starting off something a quest or something you you might be anxious about it right because you feel like you're not very well prepared for wherever it is because you are still a page you're not knight yet you're still a page so if you yeah okay so there's a line that i think that it's very good okay i'm gonna read that for you you may not have used your sword as in your skills on the battlefield as in wherever that you are approaching but you are trained and develop the skills you need to succeed so you just need to trust yourself so study um pick up something to learn today yeah so if you need help i can help you out but i'm gonna be busy today with like vet clinic stuff so there you go that's um a cut of the day for you Jung is page of sword study um, and be confident in yourself all right and for the end the end one's page 44 for a poem i'm gonna pick from a very very old book <laughs> this book is so old This book is so old. I got it from a, a secondhand store. It's uh, I think it's I'm not sure when it's printed. Uh, it's printed in 1962. <laughs> and there's a there's a name and a date and a year uh written on it as well. 
the name of the person is Tan Li Gek, University of the country I'm in, and then 1968. So this book printed, this poetry book printed in 1962 is, was owned by someone in 1968 and it's on my hands now. That is why I love buying secondhand books because you, it, it, it's, you get the history of it. And uh, yeah, it's very nice. Okay, page 44, let's go, let's go. Ooh, page 44 is, uh, it's a part of a very, can you pick another number? It's a part of a, of a, like, a, a four, of a, a four pages poem. <laughs> it's quite long. <laughs> Dian, can you pick another page? It's way too long to read. Forty-seven. Give me a second. For seven by Robert Lowell Title of the Poem is France My human brothers who live after me see how I hang my bones eat through the skin and the flesh they carried here upon the chin and leaping clutch of the cupidity now here now there the starling and the sea gall splinter the groined eyeballs of my sin brothers more beaks of birds than needles in the fathoms of the boyo tapestry God wills it, wills it, wills it, it is blood. My brothers, if I call you brothers, see the blood of Abel crying from the dead sticks to my blackened skull and eyes. What good leaven's rum and bread to Abel dead and the rotten on the cross beams of the tree. Pretty dark. I think it's about a uh, pirate. There's also a very a uh, uh, Christianity and the tone to it, like Abel and the cross beams. No. The fathoms of Boyo tapestry. God wills it, wills it, wills it. It is blood. Could it be Jesus Christ? Let me try to find out what is Boyo tapestry. It's a battle. I think it's about Christianity. 
My human brothers who live after me see how I hang. My bones eat through the skin and flesh they carried here upon the chin. And leaping clutch of their cupidity, now here, now there, the starling and the sea. Gull splinter the groin eyeballs of my sin. Brothers, more beaks of birds than needles in. The fathoms of the boyo tapestry, God wills it, wills it, wills it, it is blood. My brothers, if I call you brothers, see, the blood of Abel crying from the dead sticks to my blackened skull and eyes. What good are leavens from and bread to Abel dead and rotten on the cross beams of the tree? Reads very smoothly though very good poem actually but the title is france i wonder why from the gibbet it's pretty good i haven't read all of it yet maybe i'll choose one let me see <laughs> Robert Lowell's seems pretty. Mm, I'll choose one myself. Oh my god, there's like writing on the book too. Reflecting hopes before. Like this person the person who owned this book was trying to decipher. Wow, I love this. <laughs> Nineteen sixty eight, huh? I wonder this lady or oh man Lee Gate, Tan Lee Gate, I think Gate is uh, a woman's name. Try to pick one. Sorry, I'm quiet. I'm like flashing through the book and trying to pick a poem that I wanted to read before I end. The stream. Interesting. I'll, I'll I'll choose the last poem. It's I think it's by Ian Hamilton. Title of the poem is Pretending Not to Sleep. The waiting rooms are full of characters, pretending not to sleep. Your eyes are open, but you are far away. At home, am Ryan, with mother and the cats. Your hair grazes my wrist, my cold hand surprises you. 
the porters yawn against slot machines and watch contently. They know I have lost. The last train is simmering outside, and overhead, steam flowers in the station rafters. Soft flecks of soot begin to settle on your suddenly outstretched palms. Your mouth is dry, excited, going home. The velvet curtains, father dead, the road up to the village, your hands tightening in the thick fur of your mother's Persian, your dreams moving through Belgium now, full of your trip. There you go. That's how I end today's stream. Thank you so much for staying with me for the entire two hours of reading session. I really appreciate all of you here with me in game and in the... And in my uh, channel. Thank you so much for being here. I know those of you who couldn't make it to my channel that's fine i mean and to make it to the in-game that's fine as long as you enjoy have you ever had a dream oh. that 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 you you would you can do you skip you don't you skip you want to do you skip hell yes i forgot to start my day with that one i was a bit preoccupied with other things but thank guys you guys thank you so much for being here once again uh, next new debate, Wednesday morning, 11am, GMT plus 8. As usual, we will continue the chapter called June. <gasps> which is pretty apt because we are moving into the month of June uh, by Wednesday, was it? Like it's... Heck yeah! We are starting the chapter called June on the 1st of June. How fucking amazing is that? The timing is mwah, chef kisses perfection. Hell yeah! So we are starting June, the chapter of June of Lonely Castle in the Mirror by Mizuki Tsujimura on... Uh, no, I, did, I really didn't plan it by the way, seriously. I was supposed to read the first chapter on last Friday, then I forgot. And all shit happened but anyway uh if there is nothing that requires me to attend to on wednesday morning then we are on the right track june 1st wednesday we are going to continue the chapter june all right and i will see you guys there thank you once again for being here with me today i truly appreciate it love you guys mwah, mwah, mwah. And I'll see you guys soon and wish me luck at the vet clinic later and hope that my cat is okay. Whew. Um, good things will come and I know it. I, you manifest it. I wish you all a very, very great Monday and an amazing week ahead i'll see you guys soon love you all so much thank you once again thank you love y'all have a great day <laughs>